And from a logistical standpoint, if you can't hear either Dad or me, please just sort of raise your hand and we'll, we'll make that adjustment. But I want to begin, first of all, Jane, by thanking you and saying what a phenomenal job the Bremen Museum does, and it's in no small measure to you and the women and men who work with you to make this museum such a great place to be. It's really very heartwarming if you look out at this group. There are so many people here that have such long histories with the family, and we thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. I think your presence is a tribute to both my father and my mother. And mother, I know you like to stay in the back of the room, so if you just stand up so that I could recognize you, and I'd like to introduce you. This is my mother. And um, my mother's name is Janet Ann Lilienthal Cohn, and she is also a part of this museum because if you go to the exhibit here, you will see in a case her great-great-grandfather's Civil War rifle, Jacob Rothschild, that was used in the Battle of Vicksburg. So it is in a case on loan here as well. So thank you for that, Mother. Um, I'd also like to mention, since I understand this is being videoed, I like to try to stay out of trouble with my family. I am one of three children. I have a brother, Leslie Cohn, in Columbus, and I have a sister, Jane Cohn Colbush, in Columbia, South Carolina. And we are fortunate enough to have most of the children and grandchildren and for mother and daddy grandchildren and great-grandchildren live in Atlanta. And there are a number of them that are here today. Um, so I would like for the grandchildren of mother and daddy and the great, two of the great-grandchildren, two of my grandchildren are here today, if you guys would just stand up for a moment. So just, just for the archives, um, my husband, Harvey Danitz, whom I also would like to acknowledge, Harvey, uh, we have four children here, uh, Melissa Apple Danitz, no, Melissa Danitz Apple, excuse me, that was Freudian, Melissa, your daddy always wants your last name to be his. Um, <laughs> we have sons, Howie Rosenberg, who has two children, and his wife, Kim. Uh, Howie has daddy's namesake, Aaron. David Rosenberg, who is here with his wife, Sherry, and two of our grandchildren, Evan and Noah, and Elliot Rosenberg. And then my sister's daughter is here today, Leslie Lipson, her husband, Aaron. They have two children. My nephew, uh, bro my brother's child, Seth Cohn, is here today. And there are only two grandchildren that don't live in Atlanta. And that's John Colbush, who's in Charleston, South Carolina, and Al Cohn, who's married to Tracy, and they have three little girls. So, now to the business at hand. I think I did that all right, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. I have the unique uh, and incredible privilege of interviewing my dad about his book, Memoirs of a First Generation American. And I'm going to ask him about 15 questions. And after we conclude with that, the formal part, then we'll open up the floor for questions, provided we have enough time. In addition, he has books in the back of the room, and he'll be happy to sell them to you and sign them for you as well. You know, it's so interesting for me uh, in terms of my relationship with my dad. I want you to know that until I was about 10 years old, I thought that everybody that sang the national anthem that once it was over, you yelled, go dogs. <laughs> and that's just how it's been. So, by way of introduction, Colonel Cohn, Judge Cohn, my dad, has excelled in every endeavor that was important to him. His city, his larger community, his religion, his university, his state, and his country. He has received literally every honor that Columbus, Georgia can bestow be it civic or athletic. He has received every award that the juvenile justice system and the State Bar Association can grant. Many of them bear his name, including a building. He has received many accolades and awards from the University of Georgia School of Law and its athletic department, as well as the United States Army and Fort Benning proper. I promise you the list is endless and it's still growing. He is considered one of Columbus, Georgia's most beloved citizen he is often described as a legend and an icon in all political, legal, and University of Georgia circles. 
But to me, he's my dad, my first dance partner, the person with whom I love to talk and go to ball games. And so with this brief introduction, I would like to begin with the questions. So Dad, I always defer to you, and if there's anything you'd like to say before I ask the first question... Can I call you Gail? Yes, sir. <laughs> A, that's an old joke that Daddy and I have. When I interviewed him on my radio show, I said, my guest today is Judge Cone, and for the purposes of this interview, that's what I'll be calling him. And he turned to me without batting an eye, and he said, is it okay for me to call you Gail? So, absolutely. Okay. Along with the many achievements you have had in your life, you are now an author. Tell us, what inspired you to write this book? Well, at first, you know, uh, I hesitated to write the book because uh, I told my sweet wife, Janet Ann, that uh, memoirs sometimes end up like you're, you're on an ego trip or something of that nature, and people will think you're trying to aggrandize your existence on this earth. But the more my wife pushed me, and she's responsible for the book, I don't mind telling you, you notice when she was introduced, I did clap. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I was just going to write, I decided to first start just to write something to let my children, my grandchildren, and my uh, descendants know what kind of a person I was because they would ask questions about who was he and what did he do and so forth. And I wanted to leave something for them, like a legacy. But the more I thought about it, I thought uh, I had a chance in producing the book to do some things in my community also that I thought should be corrected. And therefore, I went ahead with the book and it, there was a, uh, particularly after a World War II, uh, and when I came back home, uh, I saw lots of things in my hometown I thought were wrong, and I, I decided to put it in the book and not pull any punches on it. So that was really the driving force of this book, not an ego trip at all. But if it's in, if they're memoirs, of course, you have to be involved yourself personally. So that's, that's the way it all started. Uh, in my community, frankly, as you know, uh, we're not Atlanta, Georgia. We have a very small Jewish community. And I will say that I didn't know at first how everything would be, but it so happened that the book really went over real well. And to, to make that a matters even better, most of the people that bought the book were not Jewish. They were non-Jews, and uh, I, I was very pleased with a lot of responses and, and mail that I received. Well, having been born, though, in Columbus, Georgia in 1916, speaking of your hometown, what was it like to grow up Jewish in Columbus, Georgia? Well, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about the 1920s, and in the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, Jewish people were not exactly uh, put at the head of the list on anything. Uh, and uh, although there wasn't any wave of anti-Semitism, but certain things happened that made you think. For instance, I remember as a little boy when I was playing with him, and that he, uh, he said, uh, my mama says I can't play with you anymore. And I said, why? He says, because my mama said, you killed Jesus. And I said, I killed Jesus. I never killed anybody. <laughs> but, you know, that was only the beginning. That was only the beginning. I thought, well, you know, just one of those things. And then uh, later on, uh, as I got a little older, uh, when I was about 14 or 15, I go to a, with some friends of mine to a boxing match. And uh, the guy that ran it was a, a soldier, uh, and uh, he uh, was decided, you know, that uh, people would like to see kids fight each other. They paid you 20 cents a round. So I thought it'd be nice 
uh, just to watch. I wasn't interested in boxing, although I, I was a YMCA boy like Dan McGill in Athens. I was a Columbus YMCA boy. But um, one of the boys didn't show up, and when he didn't show up, um, they said, is there anybody here that would like to fight this kid? And so I was by the ropes, and some of my, quote, friends pushed me, and they pushed me into the ring. And I was going to say, look, I don't want any part of this. But all of a sudden, I heard a guy holler, kill that damn Jew boy. And when I heard that, I said, I'll fight him. Uh, it was the beginning of a series of lots of things in my life that uh, when someone uh, challenged my religion and challenged me, uh, then I was going to meet the challenge because I come from a family of, where they were immigrants and they were second-class citizens. And I was determined in my lifetime that my children and my family were not going to be second-class citizens for anybody. And so that was really the driving force of what I wrote about. So it's funny thing, most of the people that were there were male people, and they uh, sort of uh, liked the idea of having a Jewish kid out there and somebody beating his brains out. Well, to the contrary, it didn't happen that way. We had a good fight, and after it was over with the kid that I fought, he put his arms around me, and then everybody clapped. Now I'm their friend. Why? Because I defended myself, and I let them know that we were proud of who we were. That was my way of showing it. And so uh, I had a number of series of things. After that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was on the ship uh, in Aquitania when I was going overseas, and all of a sudden, um, a young captain close by to me uh, uh, from, from Florida, and, of course, he went to the University of Florida. That even made me hate him. I know. That's that school again. I knew that was coming up. And uh, he, he heard my southern voice. I was a major, and he was a captain. And he just sort of sauntered up to me. There were lots of guys coming on the ship. Some of them were swarthy looking, you know. Or, uh, some of them uh, uh, looked uh, a little dark skin and so forth and so on. And he saw my fair skin. I had some freckles. So I was, you know, supposed to be just a southern guy from uh, a major of the Third Armored Cavalry. And he wanted to talk to me. And uh, he says, the first thing he said was, hey, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of Jews on this ship. Well, I turned to him and I said, listen, I don't give a damn about that at all. I said, if they're Americans and they want to fight Adolf Hitler, then I want them on my team. I thought that would be the end of it. But he persisted. He said, let me tell you about Jews. And now I'm interested. He told me, he said, first of all, they're not in combat services. They are, they are just uh, looking for easy way out. Uh, they are not good soldiers, and they, they just don't do the, good, the job. They, they're, they're not good people. And I said, permit me to introduce myself. My name is Major Aaron Cohn. With that, his eyes got up like that. And I told him, I said, you know what? What's on my shoulders? I mean, what's on my uh, uh, lapel? Yeah, lapel the cross sabers, and I said, what's that? And he said, well, that's armored cavalry. I don't want any part of y'all. He said, I don't want any part of y'all. I said, well, uh, that's a combat service, isn't it? He said, yeah. And I said, you know, you say we're not good soldiers. I've been to all the service schools and everything. And uh, you know what? I'm a damn good soldier. And you know what? You're fighting in the wrong army. You should be fighting with the Nazis instead. And he dropped his face, and I felt like throwing him overboard because I just left to go overseas. And uh, after that, uh, this young fella looked me up about five different times to come to see me 
to apologize over and over and over again. And he told me, he says, you know, I was way out of line. For three centuries, my family's been telling me how bad Jews are. He says, and now I know. And my family's not going to ever be that way anymore. So I found that was one way, you know, to stop, to find that anti-Semitism goes from one generation to another, to another, to another. And that should never happen in this country. And somewhere along the line, there has to be someone that stops it. And that was my opportunity to stop it. Because he would never be like he thought he was going to be. He was way out of the line. And so this is just an illustration of some of the things that are going on. Well, I found out, too, uh, that also uh, coming back from overseas, uh, I came back with some high point people. And uh, they, uh, these high point people uh, were not part of my own outfit. Uh, and they, were, they just didn't like officers. And, of course, what happened, they, we were down just taking it easy because the war was over. And some sergeant had had a boxing ring. It carried me back when I was a little boy fighting down in Columbus, Georgia. And sure enough, Again, the kid doesn't show up. And then I heard, I can't use the words that were said, but they kept saying, we want one of those officers to fight. In other words, they were looking for an officer to beat up. Just like when I was growing up, they were looking for a Jew to fight, to be, get beaten up. And so uh, I let it go. I let it go for about three days and three nights. And I, soon I resented the fact that they would think that I was that kind of a person just because I was an army officer. And again, you say, how can you judge people when you don't even know them and you put them in a category? And that's the same thing that we had in anti-Semitism. So I just got up and I said, I'll fight that sergeant. And when I did, we had a fight turned out real well. He put his arms around me. He hugged me. All the people who wanted to shoot every uh, officer in, uh, on the ship looked at me, and they started clapping and hoorah, 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 hoorah. And they gave me three uh, cartons of cigarettes. And I stood in the middle of the room, and I threw the cigarettes out to them. You know, that ended that. And see, uh, another illustration, of course, that what happens when people hate people or dislike people just because they're in a category like that. And that was one of the things that was part of the theme of this book that I wrote. You know, you have raised us to be extremely patriotic, and you have a very, very deep-seated uh, patriotism for this country Talk a little bit about the home in which you were raised and the person who influenced you the most in terms of your love of country. Well, that was my mother. Of course, she was an immigrant like a lot of your, your uh, forefathers were. They came to Columbus, Georgia in 1906. Uh, that uh, town gave them a place to stay. Uh, no longer with the Cossacks right up and down the street killing every Jew in sight. And so... Um, I just um, heard a lot of the stories that went on. And when I was about six or seven years old, my mother would pat me on the head and, and say, Aaron, you know how lucky we are to be Americans. And I heard this, and I heard this. And so it, it, I, I realized how lucky I was to be an American. And I think about today, a lot of times we have a lot of whiners, a lot of people carrying on, and they forget the other side of the coin, how lucky we are still to be Americans. And uh, it, it's so much better that way. Instead of focusing on what's bad, a lot of times we never focus on what's good. And so I had a sense of patriot patriotism. And of course, you know, in the Russian army, uh, if you couldn't get beyond the rank of corporal, uh, even if you were the best soldier in the world. Why? Because you were Jewish. And I knew about that, and I was determined, hey, 
I'm going to be an officer in the United States Army because my forefathers weren't able to do that. I know, Dad, that you said that one of your most treasured comments was when your longtime friend that you've already mentioned, Dan McGill, who was, was the UGA tennis coach for many years, called you a great American. And I want to take it one step further. As we speak about patriotism, you enlisted in the Army before the outbreak of World War II. The word uh, Gail is not enlisted. I was already commissioned a volunteer. And I want to say something very quickly here. When I interviewed Dad on the radio show, somebody said to me, how did it go? And I said, it went very well. He only corrected me twice. <laughs> I'm entitled to something here. Oh, Dad, you're entitled to whatever you want. I don't. So I stand corrected, sir. Continue. No, that's the end of it, basically. I know of the correction, but I want you to talk about <laughs> I want you to talk about why you enlist no, excuse me, what's why the word? Volunteer. Why you volunteered well, early I was in, for the Second I was World in War. I was in the judge's office and my branch was armored cavalry and uh, he told me I should have gone into the JAG and he'd get me a place in Washington and all that stuff and I said, No, I wanna be in the field and and so, uh, you know, uh, I hated Adolf Hitler. I wanted to kill him myself. And little did I dream that someday I would get that close. But uh, I decided to, to quit the law practice, and I volunteered for the Army. And, and you, that's what started. And I want to talk about your role in the Second World War and how it impacted your life. But before we do that, I wanted to mention that that mother's brother, Leslie Lilienthal Jr., was killed in the Second World War, and the family decided to bury him in France. Why did you encourage the family to make that decision? Well, when they talked about bringing him back to get buried in Columbus, Georgia, uh, although I usually listen to everything uh, Janet Ann's family wanted to do, frankly, to be a good son-in-law, uh, I, I decided this is one time uh, I'm not going to listen to them. I told them, you know, uh, I see a lot of crosses every time I go into a cemetery. How about the Jewish kids that got killed, you know? I like to see that Star of David in a place where the whole world can see, hey, our sons pay the price too. And I don't ever hear any talk about not being loyal, good patriotic Americans, because that's just not true. And his death meant something by being buried in that cemetery. If he was buried in the Riverdale Cemetery in Columbus, Georgia, it wouldn't mean a thing. But by being buried in that military cemetery, a lot of people go there, and they'll see that Star of David, and they'll understand something, that they're not the only people that fought this war. Our kids fought the war, too. And, and so uh, it's something that makes you proud of being what you are, proud of being Jewish, a proud of being Christian, a proud of being whatever it is. And that was something that was always inculcated in me. Talk about your role in the Second World War and how it impacted your life. Well, you know, uh, I... Uh, my unit uh, liberated a uh, concentration camp called Ebensig in, uh, in Austria, and uh, I saw it all. And it was interesting the way it all turned out. When I walked in there, of course, I had on tank boots and had a um, uh, uh, 45 pistol across uh, my, my chest. And uh, when they all saw me, and there were so many dead all over the place. They looked at me and they said, I heard one of them say, das ist ein Schutzstaffelmeier. I was an SS major. And I said, nein, ich bin es ein Schutzstaffelmeier. I'm an Americana. Oh, they said, an Americana. And they came closer. And then when I said, und ich bin ein Americana, ich judo. And when I said that, it was like, you know, likes the Super Bowl. And they did everything that they could. They wanted to hug me and kiss me. And I know you've seen it in the movies and seen it in places. 
But unless you were in a, a camp like that, unless you really were present and saw what took place, you just couldn't believe of man's inhumanity to man. And I noticed that part of it, uh, we know that roughly a million Jewish children were killed too. And that's something that never left me. Those poor little innocent children were killed just because they were born Jewish. And that stayed with me a long time. And uh, but I think you'd be interested to know that as soon as uh, they found out that I was Jewish, right away they said, do you know my Uncle Louie in San Francisco? <laughs> do you know my Aunt Dora in Brooklyn? And they went that way. They wanted to play Jewish geography with me. It showed that no matter what had happened, no matter what it would be, you're going to play Jewish geography somewhere else. So I want to congratulate all of you. We're all alike. And uh, even they, and all, all of that, they wanted to play Jewish geography. But I talked to a number of people, in, um, and they were saying they were going to go to uh, uh, Costco, and they were going to uh, Cyprus, and they were going to go to Israel. When I came home, frankly, there were a number of people who were well, uh, they were very lukewarm towards the Israelis in the is state of Israel, and they thought, well, people are going to say we have a dual uh, loyalty. And I said, that's crazy as hell. That's not the way it's going to be. I said, they are going to commend us for doing what they were supposed to do. And I, I told some of my friends who never saw anything, and I tell them, you know what? You've led a nice, wonderful life. You've never heard a shot fired in anger. And now you're trying to say they shouldn't have the rights to do what you've done all of these years. And so I was simply determined to do everything I could for the state of Israel. You know the story I'd like for you to tell? Tell the story about the person that you say saved your life during the Second World War. Well, uh, I saved his life and Evan say and and later on, he, later on, uh, in, in, uh, some of the children were in Israel on a trip, and it got to be talking about uh, the guy that was driving the, the vehicle. No, that's not the story, but you can tell that story. That's my fault. Is that your fault? That's my fault. But well, what do you want? I want you to talk about, you always tell me Adolf Hitler saved your life. Oh, that was a different thing. Though, okay, Gail. I want you to tell that one. Well... <laughs> That, let me talk what I started to do then. Uh, okay, so, you go uh, right ahead. But then after that, would you do the story about Adolf yeah, Hitler? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let's go back to what you want. No, no, Daddy. I want to do what you want. Uh, well, she's talking about, you know, and I, when people would say, hey, uh, what, what happened uh, to you that stands out in your mind? And I said, well, I'll tell you what. You'll never guess who saved my life. And they said... Uh, what do you mean? I said, well, you want to know the story? Guess who saved my life? Adolf Hitler. He said, are you crazy? How could Adolf Hitler save your life? Well, during the Battle of the Bulge, uh, my unit was along the Moselle River, and uh, everybody headed north towards Bastogne and left us there. We were just the only people there. Everybody went north to Bastogne, and uh, so my colonel, who later became a three-star general, he called up the corps commander and said, who's going to help us? Because we had two squadrons of cavalry, that's 1,500 men, and the 11th Panzer Division, and we heard, was on the other side of the river, and they had 16,000 first-class criminal troops that uh, my colonel used to worry about me and said, if they capture you, Aaron, you're gone. I said, I know all about that. But anyways, they, uh, uh, we knew that that was going to happen in the morning, and we knew everything was going to be the end of everybody. And uh, von Rundstedt had given the order to, to, to attack right through us. And uh, we waited and wait, waited, and nothing happened. Why? Adolf Hitler, the great corporal, he 
countermanded the order. So he saved my life. And you know, it's difficult when I said this is a unique, it's also a challenging experience to interview your own father because I know the stories and I sort of know some of the answers or most of the answers. And so I have a hard time trying not to lead the witness, as they say in the trade. But thank you for telling that story, Dad, because I always like that story. Watch it, yeah, you're good. <laughs> do you want to tell the next story, or shall I go to the next question? Go to the next story. <laughs> okay. Um, you are the longest-serving juvenile court judge in the country. You've been on the bench since 1965. You've had lots of other offers to take other judgeships. And you've turned them down. Why have you stayed in this position? Well, um, I kept thinking about all those children that had been killed. And uh, when I came back home, I had a little league baseball team, little league football team, helped coach the, a high school tennis team. And I found that I enjoyed working with the children. And so when I was offered a chance to go to the Superior Court, I just tell them, no, I'm going to stay with the children. And so I've stayed ever since because uh, uh, I got tired of all the hypocrisy uh, with uh, what happened to our children in the court system. They had no lawyers. They had nobody. They had a wise, supposed to have a wise old judge who was going to tell them what to do. And he himself maybe was a bachelor. He didn't care about children. He didn't want children. It was considered a very inferior court because no money involved and no big things going on. And so um, they uh, asked me what I like to be the juvenile court judge, and at the same time, Elliot, I think you and I are in the same position. I, I got a letter from the Department of the Army that I was also in zone, um, zone of consideration to Brigadier. And I decided... Uh, that I was going to stay with the children because they were kind of young and they needed some guidance. And so I started and uh, I just kept going and kept going. And some people said, uh, how long have you been there? And I said, 45 years. And they look at me like I'm a sugar <laughs> And uh, I like to tell a story if you can use a little Yiddish from time to time and get a nice laugh. Life. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it is, and I'm still there, and I'm 93 years old, and I want to keep on going until I can. Well, would you like to share any particular stories, whether they're success stories or funny stories from the court? Well, I don't want to use any bad language. <laughs> <laughs> I know one thing, you, you, uh, you certainly, if you're in my position, don't ask them if, uh, do you have anything you want to say to the court? Uh, I'm not going to repeat that, Gail. I, I'll... No, but what about the one about the, the present? Well, the only thing that I can think of that you would appreciate is that we had a, a Muslim kid that was in trouble. Yeah. Uh, he committed a felony, burglary, and he only had his mother came there. I put him on probation. Uh, later on, um, I told him, I don't want to see you again in my court. He committed another burglar. He came back, but this time he had the whole Muslim family. Everybody was there. They knew I was Jewish, and they figured, he's Jewish and we're Muslim. Uh, we're going to send that boy to uh, put him in Devil's Island. So um, I figured now I really had gotten to him, and I thought I'll never see him again. And because he's gotten the message, and he did get the message, because all the family was there. And I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I forgot he was Muslim. I said, I'm going to give you an early Christmas present. <laughs> and uh, he says, um, and they, uh, I said, I'm going to keep you on probation. And when I did that, they all, like the Feast of Ramadan, I mean, they carried on, and it was wonderful. But when I went back in chambers, a kid from the, district attorney's office said, hey, Judge Cohn said, that was really, really cool. Hey, what do you mean? That a Jewish judge gives a Christmas present to a Muslim kid. <laughs> you know, and I said, 
only in America. <laughs> and that illustrates some of the things that we talk about. So what changes uh, have you seen in juvenile crime over the years, and do you have any particular concerns that you want to share about the young people of our country? Well, I find most of the young people today, I don't believe that they had the, the great sense of patriotism that we had in my generation, or as in your generation. Uh, I don't know how it's going to work out finally, but uh, I find out a lot of times too many young people don't want to uh, listen to their parents because they feel like they are it's a free country and they can kind of do what they want to do. And I impress upon them they cannot do whatever they want to do. They, it's not what they want, but it's what they need. And I've been very, very stern about that because I think this generation that comes into my court, uh, they, uh, they need to know who is in authority. Of course, I know there are lots of ramifications to this question because sometimes you have bad parents who are part of the, the problem and instead of the solution. I don't want to go into uh, racial things because uh, the point remains, however, that even the black community has spoken out now about uh, the breakdown in, in the uh, black family. And uh, we see it all the time in our court where the father has abandoned the children and, and where are we going to get these family values from? Uh, we can't get it from the parents because they're non-existent, so to speak. They have problems themselves. We can't make them go to church. And uh, then they, the neighbors used to help out. And at Lake Tahoe, a group of us met and we said the only way we thought it could be done would be in the school systems where they had to go to school, where they had to learn uh, values, and they could teach it as a curriculum so they could get the values there even though they don't get it home. So far, it's fallen with deaf ears on my friends in education. But I'm convinced that uh, the, we'll never, never have a change in this unless we have the children knowing something about family values. Because without family values, they're going to continue to get in trouble. And we don't need them as criminals because we've got enough of them. And I know that you've worked very hard on trying to get character-based education into the school systems. and. I have every confidence that you'll get there with it. Um, we started about 20 minutes late, and I'm trying to read body language. And so what I'd like to do is maybe ask Dad a couple of more questions, do my two closing pieces, and then entertain questions from the floor. Is everybody okay s sitting wise? You know, I mean, I know it would be hard for you to say to me, no, we're not, but kind of squirm around in your seats if if we need to move a little bit faster. Gail is feeling the peer pressure now. Go ahead. But you've taught me how to withstand it. That's right. Okay. With all the many awards and honors that you received, which ones were highlights for you? I know the ones I think you should say. Well, I can't say it was my wedding ceremony. No. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, I guess getting the Bill Hartman Award. And tell us what the Bill Hartman Award is. Well, that's the, uh, an outstanding athlete and what you did uh, after you got out of school. At the University of Georgia. Um, I think that I would like to ask you... Um, Two questions combined and then one more. And the two questions I'd like to combine are, I find the story about the South when you had to take some pro bono cases and practice a criminal law case. What made you decide, as a result of that case, not to practice criminal law? Well, I felt very strongly about the way that blacks were treated in the community. And so I was a vote registrar in 1960. 
uh, when nobody wanted because it was a hot potato. But I was Superior Court judges asked me to take it, and I told them, I want you to know one thing, there can be no second-class citizens in the United States of America, and every black who qualifies is going to vote, and that's all there is to it. He said, we know how you feel. That's why we've given you the job. Well, it's kind of a cute story because I got uh, $5 a week for the job. And, uh, Just enough to buy Mama's clothes. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, uh, I, find, I, I, uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, what I wanted to do, I like, had a lot of pressure on both sides, uh, from the white community, from the black community. And finally, the one that came down on me uh, uh, was um, a member of CORE, and he said, I'm going to get your job because you're discriminating against me because you want to have a special place for them and, and the, the whites want a special place for them. And I said, we've had enough divisiveness in this community. I said, you want my job? All right. After they take out my Social Security and the other things for my $20 a month, I get $2.32. Do you want this job? He said, no, no, I don't. I says, well, that's the way it is. He said, man, you kidding me. I said, man, man, I'm not. <laughs> what we did, though, in Columbus, we took big circus tents and put it downtown. Of course, you know, I know Atlanta is different than a place like Columbus, Georgia. Uh, but we didn't have the power uh, in the black community to do the job that you can't say in Atlanta. And, but we put those tents down there, and for the first time in the history of the community, we had whites registering blacks, blacks registering whites, and it was the beginning of a new era. And so I guess uh, uh, that was one of the things that, that I felt real good about. And another thing was when the blacks couldn't serve on the jury in a criminal case, and they were not able to do so, I told them I hold no part of criminal law at that time of the game because it was a time when we had the Jim Crow laws and the Jim Crow laws were so bad. But we worked on it and I think uh, it was something that I, I wanted to do real bad and we got together. Uh, I would like to say one thing about the National uh, Committee of the Christians and Jews. Years ago, uh, I don't think the people of the Jewish faith got much respect in, in a lot of cases. For instance, at Columbus High School, we had uh, at Columbus High School in the class of 1929, uh, five, there were five Jewish children that uh, graduated Columbus High School. And a hundred and some of them had gone and were going to graduate. And they took those five Jewish children and put them on one page. I thought it was the most disgraceful thing I've ever seen in my life. And believe me, those are the kind of things that I don't think. And so later on, uh, we had a, uh, Andy Roddenberry, I know some of you know him, and Louis Kunze represent the Catholic faith, and I represent the Jewish faith. And we went to all the civic clubs and we talked to them about, we're not trying to change anybody's religion. But what we want to say is everybody is entitled in the great country of the United States of America to whatever religion they want. But if they want respect, then they should respect us if we're to respect them. I think it's got to be a mutual thing. And I think the community is a lot better uh, because of that reason. I know there are exceptions. But I think we've come a long way, certainly in my town, in that subject. And I just wanted to uh, say as an aside, when Dad said that General Polk was so worried about him if he had ever gotten uh, captured by the Nazis, many of you may know, but on the dog tags during the Second World War, it had an H for Hebrew. It did not have anything to, when Daddy used to say, you know, why is there an H on my dog tag? I'm an American. And so that was a concern, and that's no longer the case either, is it? No. Okay. No, not as far um, as I know. I want to ask uh, one last question before we do some 
um, conclusions here. And I'm asking you this question as an interviewer and not as your daughter. The yeah. question I wanted to ask you was, what would you like for people to remember about you? Well, I'd like for people to remember me that I was a, a good American, that I was patriotic, and I was honest, and I had integrity, and I cared about my fellow man. And basically, uh, that's it. Well, that's enough. Um, I would like to conclude the formal part of this program with two summaries. One is a conversation that I recently had with Dad, and the second one is a personal summary of the book. And this is the conversation. It's one that all of the children and grandchildren have with Daddy around this time of the year because Georgia football season is just around the corner. And if you listen to any of the grandchildren, you would hear them say to him, so Pop, what kind of football season is Georgia going to have this year? And his reply is almost always, well, we may have a few teams that give us some trouble, but I think we're going to have a good season. We're going to have a good year. So this time I interjected and I said, Dad, do you really think we're going to beat Florida? Do we have any chance against Florida? And of course he says, I think we can beat them. Absolutely, I think we can beat them. I said to him, Daddy, how can you say that? And he looked at me without batting an eye and he said, well, honey, if you want to be a winner, you've got to talk like one. <laughs> and to me, that's the mindset that makes him the man that he is. And here is my personal summary about the book. So what's the book about? Memoirs of a First-Generation American. To me, it's about his love of family and his commitment to its well-being of its members. It's about his pride in his heritage and the acceptance of all people within law-abiding reason. It's about concern for children and knowing that they are the future. It's about his understanding of the importance of truthful learning and the support we give it. It's about his pride in his community and making a difference. It's about honoring his country and being a good citizen. It is a pleasure for me to be able to grow older with my father, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, if you all would like, we'll take about 10 minutes. I don't think we should take longer than that. Um, because if you want to purchase any books, I'll let Dad sign, and we want to save some time for that as well. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? Yes, ma'am. Amy. I have two, and they're two very different questions. I have had the fortunate opportunity to be in Judge Kerry's very end. Yes, and there are two. I don't even know. How many pictures? Or in your desk? Hundreds. <laughs> and the last time I was in your den, you took my kids and I on the tour of your pictures, and you showed us some of your favorites, and you gave us a story about all of these pictures, and they were phenomenal. And to this very day, my kids and I still talk about that day with you. So I'm wondering if you can take a minute to describe one of the pictures that's in your den that's the most memorable to you from your military days. That's my first question. My second question is kind of contemporary, and it's a legal question. I'm curious what your thoughts are about Michael Vick and what is going on. <laughs> And what would you have done, what would you have done if he had come before you, which he might have, not sure, as a juvenile, that possibly led him down this path? So then what can we say, me in particular, to our children about what's happening? All right, so Amy first wants you to tell her about a memorable picture. I know the one that's the most memorable for me. <laughs> I like that one with the shoulder host of it, the, the, the survivor. But you pick your own. Well, you know, uh, coming back home, the, uh, the Merchant Marine, uh, they uh, took, found where our footlockers were, and they took everything we had in the footlockers, including six Lugers, um, two pearl handle Lugers that I, I had. And they uh, stole everything we had except one thing. Uh, I had a, a, a survivor who wanted to 
paint a picture of me. And uh, I told him I didn't have time for it. And it took about, he said, I'll only be there for just about an hour and a half. It was amazing. He is now a fine portrait painter, and uh, that's the most precious possession I got coming back. And that picture is in, in, in the book. And Amy's second question was, you know, if you had Michael Vick in your court, and uh, what would you, ha what do you think about his sentence, yeah. and what would you say to children to try to get them on the right path, and if Michael Vick had been in your court, what would you have done with him? Well, you know, uh, if I had, if he was in my court, and he was a juvenile, of course, uh, we are a court of rehabilitation, and of course, incarceration is a very, uh, uh, very uh, important uh, uh, in rehabilitation. But it's the same question that we've got more Monday morning quarterbacks in the juvenile court than any court in the land. They should say, you should have put him on probation. Uh, you should not have put him on probation. Right now, where there's a felony and burglary of the legislation that has said all we can do is to give him one month. And of course, it's hard for me to tell the police, you work real hard, you bring them into my court, and uh, that's all I can do. It's 30 days. I've got to wait for four felonies before I can do really something about it. There's a big argument about how to handle children, but we are a court of rehabilitation. And if Vic had been in my court and he was a juvenile, I would have given him a chance after he served some time. And I believe you have to have a certain amount of uh, compassion, as, as bad as it was, I'm not talking about murder, I'm talking about something else, but I would, I would have given him a chance to make a comeback. Any other questions? Mary Jane. I'll, I'll repeat it. For, I'll repeat it for you. Right. When you were stationed at Fort Benning, and you came home to visit, it was a rainy night, and, she, and we always called uh, the judge's mother the mom. Would you please tell what happened that night? She wants you to tell the story about the well, mama and the telephone. This is, a, this is something that probably would be good in, a, in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, portraying the Jewish mama uh, and also on Broadway. Uh, I uh, was a, a duty officer and uh, I had the flu really and it was raining and I came back and I, I told the sergeant of the guard where I was and, and uh, let me know if there was a problem and so I went upstairs. Mama said, you go upstairs and you stay up there and don't you dare come down because you're sick. So uh, the phone rang, and my mother came to the phone and said, Who? Lieutenant Cohn? Yes, he's here. What? You want him to go out in the rain? What's the matter? Are you crazy? I said, Mama, who is that? Don't worry, darling. I'll take care of this. <laughs> and I said, What? I don't care if the general... I said, Wait a minute, Mama. I'm coming downstairs. First, first thing you know, they're going to shoot me at Fort Benning. So... Uh, as well, I left, you know, her famous last words were, what kind of an army is it that would let a, a, a young man go out on a day like today? <laughs> like that. And it, if, I, if I might take a personal liberty, uh, Mary Jane Becker and Elaine Shapiro uh, ran that courthouse for a long time. And when the new courthouse opened, it's such a Jewish story, and when the new courthouse opened, each division had a reception, and everybody was hovering around the juvenile court's reception. Why? Because in every other part of the courthouse, there were some little ham biscuits, some little uh, uh, pretzels or, or um, uh, peanuts. But what was at the juvenile courthouse under the tutelage of Mary Jane and Elaine? There were trifles. There were caramel cakes. It was a regular... Barbot Mitzvah down there. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, I can't see in the back. Colonel Cohn, when, uh, at the time you volunteered for the Army, I had the bad fortune of being a Jewish teenager in Nazi occupied Germany. And what kept us alive was singing of the Jewish soldiers to the Allied armies. Now, that happened 60, 80 years ago. Read one of those soldiers and to thank you for that. 
He's thanking you for he was a child in Nazi Germany and they were waiting for the Allied soldiers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. She wants to know what you think of the present-day conflict in Iraq. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I venture to, to speak about that. I'm not at such a high level that, uh, that I, I know all the facts and everything. I think this is a matter that's in Washington, and uh, I, know I have some personal feelings about it, but I, I'd rather not go into that. Any other questions? Mickey. me a little bit more with, 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 the, with the question. That whenever you get the opportunity, whenever the opportunity arrives, that you take that opportunity and how you take it. So, Mickey is saying... Well, you know, uh, you don't have to be hostile uh, in things of that matter, but by, uh, frankly, uh, unless you attack physically, I think that you just listen to somebody like that. You go about your business. You show them by your own personal example what kind of a person you are. And that's the end of it. I don't believe that you need to make a federal case out of something like that. The main thing is individuals may do that. But the beautiful thing about the United States of America is we all have different backgrounds, all have different backgrounds. And you know what? We differ on a lot of different things. But the great thing about this country is once you are naturalized or once you're here, you are an American. And if somebody says something, it's not, it's the difference between what somebody will say to you and whether or not a crime has been committed. And for the sake of time, I'm going to just take two more questions then Daddy will be available in the back of the room if anybody wants to talk to him further. So I see one hand in the back. In the Atlantic Jewish community in the 20s and 30s and the 40s and 50s, there was a dichotomy between the Spartan, the Russian, uh -huh. and, and the German Jewish community, which was very divisive before the 1948 war, particularly in Israel. What was it like in the Okay, And you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll reframe it. It's interesting, that was one of the questions I had. And so, if you don't mind me rephrasing it, and if it isn't what you're asking, uh, we'll do it differently. Talk, talk about, in 1941, what it was like between the shul and the temple in Columbus, Georgia, when you and Mama got married. Because he's, he's a, he's a, he's a Litvak, she's a Deitch. Okay. Well, you know, that's ridiculous, of course, about those kind of things. Well, what was what it like? Did, what was it like? It was not good. It was not good at all. I, I, I've often said, what difference does it make whether your family was born in Galicia or they were born in, in, uh, in uh, Alsace-Lorraine or London or wherever? You're an American. You're an American. That's what's important. But unfortunately, uh, we, uh, in our own religion, we have not been very tolerant uh, in some uh, areas. But I think that day is gone now. I look at our own community in Columbus, Georgia, and there's no such thing. Uh, at one time, it was prevalent uh, when my wife and I got married. It was the talk of uh, the Jewish community. She was from the temple and I was from the synagogue. Big deal. I think that answers the question, doesn't it? You know, when Mother and Daddy got married, um, they, they didn't have a chuppah. And when Daddy's family came to the reception, they wouldn't stay because the, was the food kosher or they were worried that the kosher wasn't kosher enough? You know. Ah. <laughs> 
Mother said it was kosher, but it didn't suit them. She was kind of a she was kind of a Yiddish shiksa. Believe me. One last question, we'll take it. Otherwise, Dad would like to conclude with a poem. Yes, All right, Kathy, no. and, th and then uh, we're going to let Miss uh, Miss Wheel send Simon <laughs> speak, and then we'll, we'll move on. Miss <laughs> Kathy. Um, I represent the generation, I guess, sort of behind Dale and your children, and I remember, I, I want to thank you also for helping us all turn out to be such great citizens that what our parents were not able to do, they would just take us on Sundays to the, to the Harmony Club, and we'd see... We'd see Uncle Aaron, and he would tell us very sternly, week to week, that he better not see us in this court. <laughs> and, he didn't. And, and he's responsible for probably a lot of kids who are now wonderful adults staying at your court. I've only had two Jewish kids in 45 years. Wow. Two Jewish kids. And I, I think you'd like to know that, because every time I ever went to a PTA, and they came to me and talked to me afterwards. It wasn't how wealthy we were or what our social prestige was, but they all asked, what are you all doing with your families that we are not doing? Thank you all so much, and Dad, if you want to conclude with, with a poem. I, I, it's not a poem, it's a eulogy. I'm two for two. Excuse me, Dad, if he was going to conclude with a eulogy. I, I, uh, I don't play tennis for this there was a great, There was a great rabbi during World War II named Roland Gittleson, and he was in Iwo Jima, and he gave a eulogy that was, uh, uh, at first, uh, he was decorated for bravery and he was going to be given a combined uh, service for all the dead. And certain members of the clergy were very unhappy about that. So it came around to where he was just going to, to uh, uh, give the eulogy of the Jewish children who had been killed. Now, um, nevertheless, this was what he said that has always left a great impression on me, and I hope you feel the same way as I do. And this will be the end of this story. And he goes like this. Here, the men who loved America because their ancestors generations ago helped in her founding and other men who loved her with equal passion because they themselves or their own fathers escaped from oppression to the blessed shores. Here lie officers and men, Negroes and whites, rich men and poor together. Here are Protestants, Catholics and Jews together. Here no man prefers another because of his faith, nor despises him because of his color. Here there are no quotas of how many men of each group are admitted or allowed. Among these men there is no discrimination, no prejudices, no hatreds. Theirs is the highest and purest democracy. Whosoever of us lifts his hand in hate against a brother, or who thinks himself superior to those who happen to be in the minority, makes of this ceremony and their bloody sacrifice 
and commemoration, an empty, hollow mockery. To this, then, as our solemn duty, sacred duty, do we, the, the living, now dedicate ourselves to the right of Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, of white men and Negroes alike, to enjoy this democracy for which all of them here have paid the price. We here solemnly swear that this shall not be in vain. Out of this suffering and sorrow of those who mourn, this will come out to promise the birth of a new freedom for the men everywhere. And I thought this is what it embodies everything that we're talking about. I thank you very much for your testimony.